All right, hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first video lecture in the Unwrapping Plastic series. This lecture will be focusing on the relationship between plastic production and climate change. My name is Andrew Jarvis. I am the current public education and outreach intern for the Monterey Regional Waste Management District. I'm very excited to share this information with you all, as well as learn how to present virtually over Zoom, which so far has been incredibly awkward, and I am now presenting to Eeyore because I couldn't keep talking to my computer alone. <laughs> so I wanted to start this presentation by giving a brief overview of what the Unwrapping Plastics project is. It started off as a series of mini lectures delivered to the Board of Directors of the Waste Management District, then evolved into a 70 minute lecture that was given to graduate, undergraduate, and high school students across the Monterey Peninsula. It then once everything went virtual due to shelter in place, we decided to create a series of blog posts to accompany the video lectures and make these resources available to the public. So I'll start the presentation by talking a little bit about why, why I am so personally interested in plastics. So my third year of university, I studied abroad. Um, I was in Bangkok in the fall in Thailand. And that was where I first became aware or, or recognized the magnitude of the plastics crisis. It, it seemed like everywhere I went, I was having plastic thrown at me and, and seeing plastic everywhere was very concerning. Um, this image is from my walk to class. Uh, this is a corner of the Chao Phraya River, which is the main river that runs through Bangkok. And it just illustrates how much plastic there is in the river. The next semester I was in Oslo in Norway and Oslo and Norway as a whole had a significant problem with plastic pollution as well. Something that this image is from outside one of the main metro stations in Oslo. Something that not a lot of people realize is that uh, cigarette butts do contain plastic filaments and are there for plastic pollution. So my big my main takeaway for, for this year was the, just the ubiquity of the plastics crisis and how anywhere you would go, there's going to be plastic. Uh, and it really drove me to, to want to make a change in this area. So I like having quiz questions. I, I tried to have this be as interactive as possible. These are much less fun when they're done virtually and it's just me talking to Eeyore, <laughs> but I, I still wanted to include them to make, try to make this as interactive as possible. So this first quiz question is, how much plastic is recycled in the US every year? The options are 9%, 15, 21, or 30%. So the answer is 9%. So this means that 91% of plastic that is uh, consumed in the US each year is not recycled which is very concerning, especially given how recycling is promoted as a solution to the plastics crisis. And, and granted, it, it is part of the solution, but the current state of recycling in the United States is, is very low and the vast majority of plastic, 91%, is either incinerated or landfilled. All right, the next quiz question is, how much plastic do humans consume each week? Options are one, three, five, or 10 grams. So the answer for this one is five grams, and that's equivalent to a credit card. Obviously, we're not all munching on credit cards, but it's mostly ingested through microplastics. Uh, microplastics get in the food chain. They also are present in drinking water, as well as in the air. Um, Plastics, plastic fibers and microplastics are in the air, mainly coming from, from clothing, from plastic uh, polyester and acrylic clothing. So this lecture has four main parts. The first part is the history of plastic, then the pr process of plastic production, trends in plastic production, and then the relationship between climate change and plastics. So starting with the history of plastic. So most plastics were invented in the 1930s and 1940s, but they weren't introduced to consumer markets until the 1950s. This image is the cover of Life magazine. I believe it's from 1957. 
and the caption is throwaway living, disposable items cut down household chores. So really since the beginning, plastics have been marketed as a convenient alternative to reus reusables. This chart is cumulative plastic production from 1950 to 2015. And you can see that beginning in 2000, it, pr plastic production really skyrocketed and it's almost increasing exponentially. Given that 99% of plastics are made from fossil fuels, plastic production almost always starts with resource extraction. So this is through drilling, mining, or fracking. Uh, resource extraction yields oil, coal, and natural gas. This, these fossil fuels are then refined through distillation into naphtha and monomers. Hydrocarbons is another name for monomers. Naphtha is a clear color, colorless liquid that's similar to, to gasoline. And it's one of the main feedstocks for plastic production. Uh, monomers are the other main feedstock for plastic production. And the most important monomer when it, in plastic production is ethane. These monomers and hydrocarbons are then uh, refined through cracking, which is a process in which the monomers are heated to very high temperatures under very high pressure to essentially break them down into their component parts. This image on the right here is a cracking facility, and the image on the left is oil derricks. So cracking of hydrocarbons and or monomers yields olefins. The main olefins that are important when it comes to plastic production are ethylene, propylene, and butylene. And again, the most important hydrocarbon in plastic production is ethane, which is primarily sourced through fracking. So the olefins are then refined through, or they're not, they're not refined, they're modified through a process called polymerization in which the monomers and olefins are essentially bonded together to form longer chains. This image here is, I, I believe this is PET, and it demonstrates that the polymers are chains of, of olefins. So the most important polymers for plastic production are polypropylene, polyethylene, and PET. And again, these were mostly invented in 1930s and 1940s. The polymers are then refined into resin, plastic resin, and polyester, polyamide, and acrylic fibers. This also yields nurdles, which are essentially plastic pellets, so pellets of plastic resin. These are then, um, these nurdles are then melted in formed into plastic products. So plastics take up a very significant amount of oil in production. According to the 2018 BP Energy Outlook Report, 15% of non-combusted oil is used to produce single-use plastics today. This is only projected to increase. 44% of the increase in crude oil consumption through 2040 will be for petrochemical production. This means that oil consumption for plastic production, as we continue in, in our trends of rapidly increasing plastic production, oil consumption for this production is only projected to increase as well. Fracking is one of the main ways that resource is, that uh, fossil fuels are extracted for plastic production. Fracking is essentially the injection of liquid into the ground at very high pressures and at very high speeds. It's primarily in, injected into shale rock, which is essentially porous, a, a porous rock that has oil or natural gas in it. What happens is when the liquid is injected into the rock, it ch changes the pressure and it cracks the rock and releases the, the oil and natural gas. The shale rush in the in Appalachian United States is very directly connected to rise in, to the rise in ethane production. Again, ethane is one of the key 
is the most important monomer when it comes to plastic production. And ethane is one of the main gases that is yielded from fracking. Fracking is associated with a host of environmental problems. Because fracking changes the, the pressure and it, essentially it disrupts the, the stasis underground, it leads to earthquakes. There is also the risk of the leakage of methane and ethane in the collection process. And because it changes the makeup of the, the subterranean makeup, there's a risk of contamination of water supply. This could be oil or natural gas that's forced out of the shale rock, or it can be the, the liquid itself that is injected into the shale rock, and that can contaminate water, the water table, I mean. This image got, got a bit distorted, but this is to demonstrate the oil production through fracking. This light blue has really increased in recent years, especially th since 2010. And the share of, of oil that is produced from non-hydraulically fractured wells is declining in um, relative to those that extracted through fracking. This image is showing the projected trends in plastic production. You can see that it's only projected to, to skyrocket and it increase at really alarming rates. So because so there's an expected rise in plastic production, CO2 emissions from plastic are expected to triple by 2050. And this is really important to, to note because if, This is really important to note because if CO2 emissions from plastic are projected to increase as plastic production increases, there's a very real risk that plastic production will balance out the gains that we make in transitioning away from fossil fuels and other sectors. Again, what we're seeing is plastic production is increasing almost exponentially. As we transition away from fossil fuels and other sectors such as transportation and energy, we're projected in an ideal world to taper off the uh, fossil fuel consumption and associated CO2 emissions. But unless plastic production is regulated, there is a very real risk that we will out that plastic consumption, sorry, that oil consumption for plastic and associated CO2 emissions are going to outweigh the advances in other sectors. One of the reasons why it's difficult to regulate plastic production is that production data is elusive. This is due in part to the many different point sources for plastic production and also the different levels of accounting of plastic production. The UN's best estimate for how many plastic bags are produced yearly is between one to five trillion, which is kind of useless as an estimate because that's such an, that's a huge range. and it just serves to illustrate that it's difficult to track and therefore regulate plastic production. So production of plastics are expanding, uh, and particularly in Appalachian United States. There's an article from The Guardian titled, Will a Push for Plastics Turn Appalachia into the Next Cancer Alley? I'll link to it on the Unwrapping Plastics homepage as well as within this blog post. And Cancer Alley refers to a hotspot of petrochemical production. Petrochemical production includes plastic production. And Cancer Alley is located between Baton Rouge and New Orleans in Louisiana. It's primarily a low income and communities of color. And there's, it has the highest cancer risk rates out of any uh, jurisdiction in, in the United States, the, or sorry, the jurisdictions in Cancer Alley have some of the highest cancer risk rates out of in the entire US. So there is an expansion of petrochemical processing facilities, including cracking plants. Uh, what, the one that's talked about in the Guardian article is the Royal Dutch Shell Cracking Plant in Pittsburgh. 
which has the capacity of producing 1.6 million tons of plastic annually and will emit 2.2 million tons of carbon dioxide annually. This image is not of the Royal Dutch Shell Cracking Plant. Formerly, we had an image, but then we had to change all of our images to stock images due to copyright reasons. Uh, but this is a cracking facility. So the Royal Dutch Shell Cracking Plant looks a lot like this. Um, and, and something that's important to note is that the shell in the name of the cracking plant is the same shell. <clears throat> it's the same shell that sells uh, oil and gas. So what we see is there's a high degree of vertical integration of fossil fuel producers and plastic producers. So as production capacity is rising, investment is increasing in tandem. And especially since 2012, we've seen a very uh, significant increase in investment in the petrochemical industry. So since 2010, there's been $202 billion laid out for over 300 petrochemical projects. Over half of these are already completed or under construction. Plastics are also a bit of an anomaly in an economic sense. This quote says, plastics to a far greater extent than virtually any other product is actually a matter of supply driving demand. And so essentially what this means is that as plastic production increases, demand follows. And the reason why this happens is because there's so much, the plastics industry is very powerful and it's normalized high levels of plastic consumption. And as more and more plastic is produced, because levels of consumption are, are normalized, uh, demand for these products rises in tandem. So 8.3 billion tons of plastic have been produced since 1950. That's a lot of plastic. It's very difficult to visualize 8.3 billion tons. So that's equivalent to 80 million blue whales. And I like to, when I was giving this presentation in person, I liked asking classes um, how many blue whales you'd be able to fit in the room. I guess you can just imagine in your, in your living room how many blue whales you can fit in it. This room, you can probably fit maybe a quarter of a blue whale. <laughs> so the, the point here is that there's a lot of plastic that has been produced, 8.3 billion tons. And of that 8.3 billion tons, 5.8 billion, so 70% has been used once. And the vast majority of that is discarded or, or sorry, is sent to the landfill or incinerated. Again, only 9% of plastic in the United States is recycled annually. And uh, of that 9%, I believe, 0.9% has been recycled more than once. So the vast majority of plastic that is recycled, which is again a very, very small proportion of total plastics, the vast majority of that plastic is recycled one time and then discarded. I like to end this first lecture with this quote, we need to cut emissions by 45% by 2030. Plastics are poised to do almost exactly the opposite. Again, I want to emphasize that as we transition away from fossil fuels in other sectors, unless plastic production is regulated and addressed, there's a very real risk that the emissions from pe the petrochemical processing industry will outweigh hard won advances in other sectors. All right, so that's the end of this presentation. Thank you for listening and for tuning in. And I look forward to the next uh, lecture.